In this video, the second part of a two-part series, I'll be answering the question, was it worth upgrading from my cheap Sony kit lens, a standard zoom lens, to a very expensive Sigma art lens, the 24 to 70 millimeter? Let's find out. In case you missed it, in the first video, I gave an AB comparison without giving the results of what a kit lens versus a more expensive lens would look like. And hopefully you participated and left your comment. If you want to skip to the answers, I left timestamps in the description down below. So just click through it and you'll get the answer. Now, before we begin, I just want to talk about my testing methods. Now, obviously I tried to match everything when I was comparing between a different system, the micro four thirds and the full frame and different lenses. I tried to keep the same white balance, the focal length, but it can be rather difficult. So you might see some variations in the picture quality. So this isn't a fully scientific test, obviously. And you might be wondering, okay, so why is the test of just you talking in front of the camera? Well, for my specific needs, that is my A roll. That is something that I film the most often. And that's something that I really care about. If you really want to compare picture quality or contrast and all that stuff, you can go out and take a picture of a brick wall and that would give you a good sense of how sharp the lens is corner to corner in the center. But for me, that isn't a practical real world example that I would be using these lenses. So with those two disclaimers in mind, let's jump into the test and see the results. So for the first test, I want you to guess which one is a micro four thirds system and which one is using the full frame system. Now it's very difficult to match the color science of two different camera systems. So it may or may not be obvious which one is full frame and which one is a micro four thirds. The key things that I'm trying to match between all these different takes is the white balance, the amount of light in the scene, and of course the focal length. So here we switch to the different camera. Let me know what you think is better a or B, leave a comment down below. And by better, I mean, which one do you think is full frame and which one do you think is the micro four thirds? Now I'm gonna be running this A, B clips for quite some time. So if you just wanna to skip to the next section, obviously, like I said many times before, use the timestamps in the description down below so you can skip to certain parts, kind of like chapter links. Let me know what you think is the full frame system versus the micro four thirds system. Full frame is obviously the Sony a7C with a Sigma lens and the micro four thirds is using the Panasonic G9 with the 12 to 35 f2.8 lens. And here's the answer. A was using the micro four thirds Panasonic G9 system. Now we're going to talk about sensor equivalence. This is a very important topic that I want to cover because you're going to be seeing obviously the Lumix 12 to 35 f2.8 versus a Sigma, which is the 24 to 70 millimeter. Well, in terms of the equivalence, let me explain it really quickly. There is a crop factor because of the sensor size difference between micro, thir thir micro four thirds and the full frame. Micro four thirds is a crop factor of two. So in terms of the focal length and the aperture rating, you're going to multiply that number by two to get equivalence. But you also need to get the equivalence in terms of the ISO. So ISO is a little more interesting. It's actually the crop factor squared. So all in all, when you do this together, let's say I'm at 50 millimeters on the full frame sensor, that's going to be equivalent to a 25 millimeter. And likewise at F 2.8 on the micro four thirds system, it's going to be F 5.6. And then for the ISO, it's going to be 200 to 800. Now, interestingly, I've been getting more light when I'm using the crop factor squared. So I had to dial down the ISO on the full frame sensor to 500 ISO. I hope someone in the comments can help clarify why I have to dial down the ISO on the full frame and I can't use the equivalent formula, which is the crop factor squared. Now I should be using 800 ISO, but I have to dial down to 500 ISO to more or less match the exposure on the, on the, on the micro four thirds system. And I'm not sure why, but my guess it has to do with pixel density, because as you see, the Panasonic G9 has a 20 megapixel on a, a micro four thirds sensor, which is obviously a lot smaller, one quarter, one quarter the size of a full frame sensor, the full frame sensor pixel count on the a7c is 24 i think i believe 24 megapixels so the pixel density is going to be a lot larger on the full frame sensor so perhaps that's the reason why it can absorb more light and therefore i can have a lower iso and not actually use the crop factor squared law anyways if anyone can clarify this because i've done a lot of research and i couldn't find the reason why please let me know in the comments down below so i'm currently on the full frame camera and i've stopped down to f 2.8 and as you can tell, the background is a lot blurrier. This is because obviously there's shallow depth of field. F2.8 is not the equivalent of F2.8 on a micro four thirds system. It's actually equivalent to 1.4. And I don't have a zoom lens on the Panasonic G9 that can go down to 1.4. So this is where the major benefit comes with full frame. At the extreme ends, you're gonna get obviously a better low light performance. I kept the environment the same amount of light. I had to lower the ISO to ISO 160. So that should produce a cleaner image than that of the Panasonic G9 with the same equivalent environment with the same amount of brightness. 
However, when it comes to formatting this and putting this on the internet, I feel like you're not going to see any difference other than the background blur. But in terms of the noise reduction, you're probably not going to see much of a difference. So in my opinion, paying almost double the price to upgrade from the Micro Four Thirds system to the full frame system, we're talking about $1,500 to $3,000 for the camera body and the lens, I don't think it was really worth it. If you look at the image quality, yes, there's differences in the color science just a little bit, but the overall image quality is more or less the same given these conditions. Of course, on the extreme end, if you want that bokeh blur, you probably will be better on the full frame system, but I don't think it's worth paying double the price. However, the price may be justified if you really care about the autofocus performance of the Sony body versus the Panasonic body. Filming yourself with autofocus on a Panasonic camera is almost near impossible and not something you really want to rely on unless you want to use manual focus. In my case, I'm very lazy and I don't want to have to care about setting manual focus all the time when I'm self-filming, so I don't mind paying the extra money to get that autofocus. But if Panasonic had the same autofocus performance as the Sony, I would not ever upgrade from Micro Four Thirds to full frame because in my experience, the image quality improvement is negligible. Okay, so at this point, we're no longer to be comparing the Micro Four Thirds system versus the full frame system. We're just gonna be comparing a cheap kit lens versus the Sigma very expensive art lens. And this is the test that was featured in the first video, part one. We compared A1 to B1 and B2 to A2. And they're different focal lengths, but this is the same full system, full frame system, but we're just using a different lens. We're using, like I said before, a really cheap lens, and uh, yeah, so let me know what you think is the cheap lens and which one is the more expensive Sigma 24 to 70 millimeters. Like I said, this is going to run for a while, so definitely use the times code stamps down below if you want to fast forward to the next part. And obviously this is a bit wider, so that gives you some sense of how it performs at different focal lengths. And here's a side-by-side -side comparison at the 28 millimeter focal length. One is slightly a bit wider and it has nothing to do with which lens. It's just hard to get the correct uh, zoom setting when you're using the Sigma art lens because it doesn't have a 28, 28 millimeter marker on the zoom range. Okay, so A1 was the Sigma lens. So how many of you got that right? I'm really, to be honest, I found it really difficult to find the difference between the A1 and A2. The Sigma seems a bit warmer in terms of the color temperature tone. So maybe that's something that kind of gave the the hint of which one is which. Now this is a thousand, $1,100 lens and the other one is a $300 lens. I mean, when you buy it with the whole kit and whatnot. So I don't know, are you paying an extra you know, $700 to get that better image quality, the better sharpness, better contrast when we're at stop down to F4 and above? I'm not fully sure about that because, because according to that test I showed in my first video, there was this website that shows the differences between the sharpness when they measured it using a very specific type of sharpness indicator, I didn't really see much difference. In fact, I did see kind of improvement on the kit lens. So uh, it's kind of confusing. Maybe the my kit lens is just a really good copy or the kit lens is just really good. Or perhaps the Sigma lens is pretty bad and I have a bad copy. I don't know. So please let me know in the comments down below. And here it is at f2.8. Obviously, there's a bit, little bit more background blur. Okay, so same test, same system, full frame system. One is the cheap kit lens and the other one is the very expensive, three times the cost, the Sigma lens. And this is obviously at a tighter focal length at 50 millimeters. So this gives you a sense of how it performs at kind of the mid-range zoom. So which one is which? Here's a side-by-side -side comparison, A2 or B2. Let me know what you guys think. Okay, so we're gonna get to the answer. Here it is. A2 was the kit lens. And like I said before, I still don't see much difference. Obviously we have to go to F5.6, which is unfortunate. And uh, on the actual Sigma lens, we can go down to F2.8 to get more blur. But honestly, I'm looking at the background and it, the, blur looks the blur looks pretty good. The bokeh looks pretty good. I, I'm more into video. I don't really need to have that extreme blur like what you see right now. So I don't care for that blur. And then, you know, it's something that you're going to pay lots of money for. And I feel like it's just kind of a statement to show like, oh, you're, I'm so good. I'm so good at film. So I want to wrap this whole up, this whole experience of migrating from the Micro Four Thirds world to the full frame and then upgrading my kit lens. What do I think about it all in all? Well, let's go over the pros first of upgrading to the Sigma lens specifically. The pro so far is that I really do enjoy the 24 millimeter focal length. I find that I live in a very small place and everything is really tight. So being able to get a really wide angle is critical, especially when you're filming indoors, with very tight spaces. So I do appreciate that extra focal length that four millimeters does make a pretty decent difference. Although I want to caveat that with saying that I probably would survive with a 28 millimeter if I opted to stay with the kit lens or go with the Tamron 28 to 75 millimeter version. 
Another pro, but it may be a con later, is that I really like the look of the lens, the design looks amazing, and how it feels. It's obviously a very hefty, very heavy, and very large lens, but it does make me feel very giddy inside every time I look at it, and it just kind of makes me want to film more. But I'm a little bit hesitant to take this outside, and that might lead to my next con. So as for the cons, this is a very heavy lens. It's very difficult to vlog with, especially if you're gonna be hand holding the camera. So I don't recommend use it, using this for vlogging, which is a shame because the 24 millimeter focal length is, is pretty wide to allow for vlogging, but the weight kind of counter, counteracts that entire use case, for example. Now, despite this lens being so big and heavy and premium build, given that it costs so much, especially in comparison to a kit lens, which feels very cheap and plasticky, I'm personally very afraid to take this out in the real world and kind of use it because I just don't want to destroy it. I can't afford to replace it. And I think that's one major con for me. Specifically, this is very subjective, obviously, but having very expensive camera gear really does limit my use of kind of just throwing this gear around and going outside and just really treating it poorly. Now, if I was a really rich person and I had this lens, I probably wouldn't care. I would just go outside and you know, if I get a scratch on it, it's not the end of the world. But for me, my personal financial circumstances, I'm a little afraid to take this out. And with all the talk online about dust getting in this lens very easily, I'm extremely scared to take this out. So I don't know if that is a true concern. So far, it's been like five days and I have not seen any dust in the lens. So fingers crossed that it was a defect for the early batch of Sigma lenses and that isn't gonna happen in later. Perhaps Sigma uh, addressed it quietly by making a better seal on the lens. So what do I think about the image quality? Is it worth paying an extra thousand dollars to upgrade from the kit lens? And this may be very subjective. In my personal opinion, I don't see a major difference in image quality, sharpness, and contrast. It was very hard for me to distinguish between the kit lens and the more expensive Sigma standard zoom lens when we're at 5 f4 and above. So if you're trying to match this apples to apples at the, at the right aperture setting, f4 and above, it's kind of very difficult to see the difference. Now, obviously, if you step down to f2.8, you're going to get that cool, very coveted bokeh background blur that everyone every YouTuber really want, strives to get. But personally for me, coming from the micro thirds world, I'm not sure if it was worth paying an extra thousand dollars to get a little bit of bl blurry background. Now, of course, you're gonna get a faster uh, lens, which will let in more light. So then you, you can theoretically use less light to light up a scene. But in the end, I'm in an indoor environment. I'm always gonna have light. So I find that that low light performance isn't so crucial for my certain application of this camera. So what about the buttons on the actual lens? Is it worth paying a premium over the Tamron 28 to 75 millimeters? Well, for my personal use case, I feel like these buttons are not very used at all. Now, here's my complaint. Given that the autofocus on the Sony a7C is so good, I won't be using manual focus that often. Now, obviously I'll be using it if I wanna pinpoint the focus point, specifically when I'm behind the camera, but most of, this, most of the time I'm gonna be in front of the camera and I have no way to control the focus, so. I feel like that button is not a big deal and it's okay to go into the function manual to switch between manual and autofocus. Now in terms of the other button, the custom C1 button on the lens, I thought I could use that lens to quickly toggle between steady shot on and steady shot off or stabilized versus non-stabilized. But unfortunately, it doesn't do that. There's no way to toggle that option, which is really annoying because this is something that I've been accustomed to in my previous Micro Four Thirds camera lens where you're able to mechanically turn off the stabilization for both the lens and the body. Sony doesn't give you the option to toggle between stabilization and on and off. Instead, you see a little prompt where you can swap between on and off and you have to use the directional pad to move up and down to select the correct stabilization setting you want. So it isn't as quick as I had imagined. So all in all, I thought I would use these buttons a lot more, but I actually don't use them very often. So my idea of choosing this lens over the Tamron, which has no buttons, wasn't the greatest idea after all. So in the end, if the future me told me about the results of this test, I probably would not have upgraded. Now, obviously I upgraded and I don't wanna return this lens because I am probably have returned too many items already in the past. I just don't wanna return more things. So I'm kind of forced to keep this lens. And obviously I'll look on the bright side. Yes, I do get that cool background blur. And in certain situations where I don't have control of the light and it's pretty dark, I'm sure that F2.8 is gonna be very helpful. The one specific use case where I can see using this faster lens is gonna be very helpful is if I want to use the post-production stabilization in Catalyst Browser. In order to use that, you'll have to crank the shutter speed really fast and that will let in less light. So being able to have that faster aperture is gonna be very beneficial if I want to stabilize my footage using the gyro data in post-production. Anyways, that is my conclusion of upgrading from my kit lens to the Sigma 24 to 70 millimeters. Please let me know what you guys think if, if I was wrong in the image quality, the sharpness test, maybe I'm not seeing things. Maybe the YouTube compression is making things very hard for me to see, but 
from my perspective, it wasn't a great update. And obviously I, I don't regret it, but maybe I could have used that money elsewhere. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.